Lecture 17 Short-Term Memory, Working Memory, and Attention In the last lecture, we saw one of the ways in which perception is related to memory, which is that, in the act of perception, the perceiver draws on information stored in memory. Perception doesn't just extract information from the stimulus. Perception, as the active construction of a mental representation of the environment, as a problem to be solved by the perceiver, draws on the perceiver's permanent repository of world knowledge stored in memory, as well as the perceiver's more momentary expectations about what he or she is going to encounter. These expectations are also stored in memory. But that's not the end of it. Perception doesn't just draw on memory. It also changes memory, because perception leaves a trace of itself in memory, a mental representation of the stimulus event which persists after the stimulus itself has been terminated. Memory frees our experience, thought, and action from control by the immediately present physical stimulus environment and allows us to perceive, contemplate, and respond to events in the past as well as events in the present. Viewed from this perspective, Memory is critical for what we ordinarily construe as intelligent behavior, and certainly it's a necessary component for any system that is to learn from experience. We talk about memory as if it's one thing, but a little reflection shows that there are lots of different kinds of memory. One distinction among memories is temporal, how long the memory lasts. This distinction is based on the intuition that remembering an unfamiliar telephone number that you've just looked up is somehow different from remembering your own telephone number or the telephone number of your boyfriend or your girlfriend. One memory is permanent, the other is gone almost instantly. This intuition is captured in a classic view of memory known as the multi-store model of memory proposed by a number of investigators in the 1960s. The multi-store model of memory is based on a computer model of the mind and distinguishes among three different types of memory, three different storage structures that hold information either temporarily or permanently. Information moves among these structures by means of a set of control processes. At the earliest stage of memory processing is a set of sensory registers, one for each sensory modality, that hold a complete veridical representation of sensory input. They hold all the information that's presented to them. The sensory registers draw on information held in long-term memory to recognize patterns of features in the manner I described earlier in the lectures on perception. In the model, some subset of the information held in the sensory registers is then transferred to a second store known as short-term memory, by virtue of a control process known as attention. By paying attention to some things as opposed to others, those things we pay attention to get transferred into short-term memory. Items in short-term memory can be maintained there indefinitely by means of another control process known as rehearsal. Again, think of the telephone number example. You look up a telephone number, and then you repeat it to yourself over and over again until you get a chance to write it down or dial it. That's what rehearsal is like. You stop rehearsing the number and pretty soon it disappears from memory. But by means of yet another control process, known as encoding, information can be transferred from the relatively temporary short-term memory to the permanent repository of stored knowledge known as long-term memory. And finally, by means of yet another control process, known as retrieval, information can be transferred from long-term memory to short-term memory. If I ask you what your telephone number is, you pull that information out of long-term memory and hold it in short-term memory while you answer my question. The multi-store model of memory became very popular in psychology. So popular, in fact, that it was known as the modal model of memory that is, the model of memory that was embraced by the largest number of investigators. 
They all had the same idea, that memory was a collection of storage structures linked by a set of control processes, though the particular names that they gave to these structures differed from one model to another. Sometimes the sensory registers were called sensory memories or sensory stores. Short-term memory was sometimes called primary memory. It's now often called working memory. Long-term memory was sometimes called secondary memory. And the models differed among themselves in terms of various details. But the general idea that there was a set of storage structures linked by a set of control processes is what the multi-store model of memory is all about. Let's look for a moment at the properties of each of these storage structures. As indicated before, the sensory registers contain a complete, veridical, that is, accurate, representation of sensory input. They're of unlimited capacity, so they're able to hold all the information that's presented to them at one or another of the sensory surfaces. According to the model, there's one sensory register for each sensory modality. But two of the sensory registers have been studied most intensively, and they've been given special names. The icon, the sensory register for vision, and the echo, the sensory register for audition. According to most versions of the multi-store model, the sensory registers store information in pre-categorical form. That is, the input is not yet processed for meaning. These sensory registers have unlimited capacity, but information is held in the sensory registers for only a brief period of time, perhaps less than a second. Unless some information is transferred from the sensory registers to short-term memory, it's gone. Information is lost from the sensory registers either through a decay process or by displacement by newly arriving information. It can't be maintained in the sensory registers by any kind of cognitive activity. We know about the properties of the sensory registers from experiments employing a paradigm initially devised by George Sperling, in which subjects were briefly presented, that is, for just a few hundred milliseconds, less than a second, with a three by four visual array of letters. After the array disappeared, it was followed by a retention interval of up to one second, just a second, after which the subjects were asked to report the contents of the array. There were two conditions under which they were asked to make these reports. In the whole report condition, the subjects were asked to report the entire array, all 12 letters. In the partial report condition, the subjects were cued by a tone of low, medium, or high pitch to report the contents of only the bottom, middle, or top rows. Here are the results of the experiment. In the whole report condition, the subjects were able to report relatively few of the items, only about four or five on average. But in the partial report condition, the subjects performed considerably better. If the tone was presented before the array was shown, or precisely when the array was shown, the subjects were able to report virtually its entire contents, nine or ten of the letters. The implication is that the entire array was actually represented in iconic memory, because the subjects could report accurately the contents of any randomly selected row. So the contents of all the rows were available to them. However, even in the partial report condition, memory dropped off rapidly over the retention interval. With retention intervals of just one second, the performance equaled that of the subjects in the whole report condition. In the whole report condition, apparently, subjects couldn't extract all the information in the array before it decayed. So this simple experiment tells us that all the information in the vis visual array is available in the sensory register so long as you can get it out. You've got to get it out very fast because it decays very rapidly. Something like the sensory registers is almost logically necessary for the sensory perceptual system to make contact with memory. But some investigators have wondered just how useful it is. After all, in the real world, stimuli usually remain present for longer than just a few hundred milliseconds.
And this ecological fact, this fact about the environment, may obviate any need for the sensory registers. As the psychologist Ralph Haber once put it in a famous paper, iconic memory may only be useful for reading at night in a lightning storm. Still, the sensory registers are memory storage structures, the point where sensory information first makes contact with the cognitive system. And they do give an organism the opportunity to react to very brief events. It's been proposed that the icon was probably especially useful in the evolutionary scheme of things because it enables organisms to catch the movements of predators and prey that are very rapid. And the echo seems even more useful because many sounds are normally brief, in particular the sounds that make up the phonemes of spoken language. Short-term memory is probably of clear relevance to everyday life and not just for remembering telephone numbers either. Information is transferred from the sensory registers to short-term memory after it's received some degree of processing, after it's been subject to feature detection, pattern recognition, and directed attention. In some versions of the multi-store model, primary memory, or short-term memory, is thought of as storing an acoustic representation of the stimulus, that is, what the name of the stimulus is, or a description of what the object or event sounds like. In any event, short-term memory has a limited capacity. It can contain only a small number of items at one particular time, a number that's been estimated in a famous paper at about seven plus or minus two items. Think about telephone numbers. There's the three-digit exchange, and there's the four-digit number. In fact, it was psychological experiments at Bell Laboratories that determined just what the limits of a usable telephone number might be. Information in short-term memory can be retained there indefinitely by means of rehearsal, repeating it over and over, either out loud or to yourself. With enough rehearsal, especially, as we'll see later, enough rehearsal of a particular kind, information can be transferred from the temporary store of short-term memory to the permanent store of long-term memory. If it's not rehearsed, the information in short-term memory either decays over time or more likely is displaced by new incoming information. Again, the capacity of short-term memory is limited to seven plus or minus two items. So if you're going to put anything new in, something's got to come out. In order to demonstrate the limited capacity of short-term memory, let's do an experiment known as the digit span test. I'm going to read to you a list of digits, and then after I stop, I want you just to write them down. Here's the first list. Five, nine, zero. Write it down. Here's the next list. Four, eight, six, one. Write it down. Here's the next list. Seven, three, zero, nine, four. Write it down. Here's the next list. Two, four, nine, six, five, eight. Write it down. Next list. One, four, six, eight, two, four, five. Write it down. Next list. Three, nine, two, one, five, seven, six, zero. Write it down. 
Next list. 6, 2, 5, 7, 3, 9, 1, 8, 4. Write it down. One more list. 0, 6, 3, 8, 9, 4, 1, 7, 2, 5. Write it down. Okay, now turn to the next slide and check your lists against the lists I just read. Here are the lists. You probably got the first three or four lists with no trouble at all. Then you started having a little bit of trouble remembering all the items when we got to lists of five or six items in length. Seven items, even harder. Eight items, probably too hard. The capacity of short-term memory is seven plus or minus two items. It doesn't have to be digits. You can also do this with letters. Here's an alphabetical digit span test. I'm going to read you a list of letters, and I want you to write them down after I stop. Here's the first list. Y, S, P, B, C, U, J, B, L, D, S, L, B, G, K, A, I, C, I, B, F. Write them down. Okay, here's another one. F, B, I, C, I, A, K, G, B, L, S, D, L, B, J, U, C, B, P, S, why? Write them down. Now turn to the next slide and check your list. Okay, here they are. For the first list, you probably got the first five, maybe six or seven items, but then it was all over. But in the second list, which had the same number of letters, you might even have gotten all of them. That's because in the second list, as opposed to the first list, you could break the letters up into meaningful chunks. FBI, CIA, KGB, the old Soviet secret police, LSD, LBJ, the initials of an American president, UCB for UC Berkeley, PSY for psychology. Chunking items together in this way is a means of increasing the effective capacity of short-term memory. So the capacity of short-term memory isn't 7 plus or minus 2 items. It's 7 plus or minus 2 chunks, where the chunks can actually be pretty large. If you chunk the items together, grouping them together into meaningful units, all you have to do is remember the chunks. So, to return to our example of the telephone numbers, these days telephone numbers are pretty long. There is the traditional seven-digit telephone number consisting of a three-digit exchange and a four-digit number. But then there's a three-digit area code and maybe a two- or three-digit country code. Put those all together and you've got a string of digits that vastly exceeds the capacity of short-term memory.
but by virtue of chunking, you can, you can remember quite a bit. So, for example, all telephone numbers at the University of California, Berkeley, begin with either 642 or 643, so you don't have to know those three numbers. All you have to do is remember whether it's a 2 or a 3. Berkeley is in area code 510. Most of the east part of San Francisco Bay is in 510. San Francisco is 415, New York 212, Washington 202, and so on. The country code for the United States is 1, for England 44, for Italy 39, and so on. You don't have to remember all these numbers. All you have to do is remember the chunks. And that brings us to long-term memory, the permanent repository of stored knowledge in the mind. In some sense, long-term memory is a passive store of knowledge. Whereas we're immediately aware of the contents of short-term memory, we're not immediately aware of all the contents of long-term memory. We have to retrieve that information and bring it in to short-term memory. The capacity of long-term memory is essentially unlimited. So, whereas the capacity of short-term memory is roughly seven plus or minus two items, or chunks, there seems to be no limit to the amount of stuff you can get into long-term memory. And long-term memory is also appar apparently permanent. Information might be lost from the sensory registers or from short-term memory through decay or displacement, but there's essentially no forgetting from long-term memory. Now, obviously, we do forget things from long-term memory, but as we'll see later, there are reasons for thinking that those items are not permanently lost. Forgetting from the sensory registers or from the short-term memory is permanent, but forgetting from long-term memory appears to be a temporary thing. Support for a distinction between short-term and long-term memory is provided by a phenomenon known as the serial position effect. Consider a form of memory experiment known as single trial free recall. The experimenter presents a list of items for a single study trial, and then the subject simply must recall the items that were presented to him or her. If we plot the probability of recalling each item against its position in the study list, we typically observe a bowed curve. Items in the early or late portions of the list are more likely to be recalled than those in the middle. These are known as the primacy and recency effects in memory. In the primacy effect, memory is better for items that occurred early in the list compared to items that were in the middle. In the recency effect, memory is better for the last items in the list compared to the middle. The primacy effect appears to reflect retrieval from long-term memory. The recency effect appears to reflect retrieval from short-term memory. But how do we know this? How do we know that primacy reflects retrieval from long-term memory and recency reflects retrieval from short-term memory? It turns out that the primacy and recency effects are affected by different sorts of variables. For example, slowing down the rate of presentation, increasing the interval between adjacent items, and thus increasing the amount of rehearsal each item can receive, increases the primacy effect, but has no effect on recency. The idea is that by giving the item more opportunity for rehearsal, we increase the likelihood that it will be transferred to long-term memory. Similarly, increasing the retention interval, the period of time after the list has been presented, but before the subject has been asked to recall the items, affects recency, but not primacy. Even with a relatively short list, increasing the retention interval to as little as 30 seconds virtually abolishes the recency effect. Of course, the trick in this experiment is that the retention interval is filled by a distracting task to prevent the subject from overtly rehearsing the items. Still, slowing the rate of presentation increases primacy but has no effect on recency, and increasing the retention interval has a big effect on recency 
but no effect on primacy. This tells us that the primacy and recency effects are due to quite different kinds of memory. Other evidence supporting a distinction between short-term and long-term memory comes from neuropsychological studies from patients like HM, who had amnesia. Testing revealed that patient HM had a normal digit span, seven plus or minus two items, just like everybody else. Apparently, his short-term memory was unimpaired. But no matter how slowly you presented a list of words in free recall, he just couldn't remember any of it, even after just a short period of distraction. He seemed to have no capacity for long-term memory. Interestingly, there is another patient, known as patient KF, who has damage in quite a different area of the brain, the left occipital parietal area, who has exactly the opposite pattern of memory impairment. Patient KF has severely impaired digit span, apparently no short-term memory, but normal free recall of lists even as long as 10 items, apparently normal long-term memory. So here we have two patients, patient HM, who has normal short-term memory but impaired long-term memory, and patient KF, who has impaired short-term memory but normal long-term memory. This pattern certainly suggests that short-term and long-term memory are structurally distinct. But there's a problem. Remember that the multi-store model of memory says that short-term memory is the pathway to long-term memory. It's by virtue of rehearsal that items move from the short-term store to the long-term store. But if KF doesn't have any short-term memory, how does KF get long-term memory to begin with? Findings like this led some investigators to abandon an important aspect of the multi-store model of memory, which held that short-term memory was a pathway to long-term memory, that it was somehow necessary for long-term memory to occur. We no longer think that's the case. That's not to say that we don't have something like short-term memory. We obviously do. But recent theorists have begun talking about a working memory instead of a short-term store. Working memory is so named because its function goes way beyond the function attributed to short-term memory, which is simply to keep an item in an active state. Working memory does keep items in an active state, but it keeps them in an active state while work is being performed on them, while the information in short-term memory is being used in the service of some task. So working memory is not simply a route to long-term memory. Rather, it's like a cognitive workspace where information is actively processed. Here's one view of what working memory might look like. And as you can see, it consists of a number of different elements. There is, for example, a structure known as a phonological loop for auditory rehearsal, like repeating a telephone number over and over again. And there is a visuospatial sketch pad that recycles visual images of a stimulus in the same way. And there's a central executive that controls conscious information processing that is actually operating on the information that's in working memory. And then there's a buffer memory that connects the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad to long-term storage. You could think of working memory as just another name for short-term memory, but there's a big difference, which is that much more goes on in working memory than the simple rehearsal that was the primary function of short-term memory. If you continue in your studies of psychology, you're going to see a lot more references to working memory than you do to short-term memory these days. The distinction between short-term memory and long-term memory has a long history in psychology. It goes back at least to the time of William James in the late 19th century, who distinguished between primary memory and secondary memory in terms of attention. Primary memory, which is what James meant by short-term memory or working memory, is the memory we have of an object while we are still paying attention to our image of it, our mental representation of it, while we're rehearsing or thinking about it, or doing something else to it in short-term or working memory. 
Secondary memory, or what we would now call long-term memory, is the memory we have of an object once we've stopped paying attention to it. Let's go back to the telephone number example. Someone gives you her telephone number, and you rehearse it to yourself, or you think about it, or you divide it up into chunks so you can remember it better later. You perform some work on it. You're paying attention to that number all the time. Then you get interrupted. You start talking to somebody else, and you're no longer paying attention to that telephone number. You're paying attention to the new thing. So while you're paying attention to something, it's in short-term or working memory, what James called primary memory. After you've turned your attention to something else, then the representation of that telephone number resides in long-term memory, or what James called secondary memory, or memory proper. Which raises the question, if attention is what links perception and memory, then what's attention? Well, James had an answer. He said, everyone knows what attention is. It's the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Vocalization, concentration of consciousness, are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. James's verbal description of attention has never been bettered, but cognitive psychologists have now achieved a much more detailed understanding of the mechanics of attention. Some of the earliest studies of attention made use of a paradigm known as dichotic listening, based on what has been called the cocktail party phenomenon. When you're at a cocktail party, there are lots of conversations going on, but you can only pay attention to one of these at a time. And attentional selection is accomplished, in some respects, by virtue of spatial and visual processing. You look at the person you're talking to, and if you should happen to look away for a moment, for example, to ask somebody to refresh your drink, you maintain the conversation by staying focused on the sound of the other person's voice. Of course, the moment you look away, your attention is distracted from the conversation and you're likely to miss something that's been said. Attention seems to be drawn and focused based on physical grounds. Colin Cherry, a British psychologist, simulated the cocktail party phenomenon in an experimental paradigm known as dichotic listening, or shadowing. In a dichotic listening experiment, the subject is asked to repeat, or shadow, a message presented over one of a pair of earphones, or speakers, while ignoring a competing message presented over the other device. Normal subjects can do this successfully, but their ability to repeat the target passage comes at some expense. While they're able to remember pretty much of what was presented over the attended channel, they pretty much forget whatever was presented over the unattended channel. Moreover, while they generally noticed when the voice on the unattended channel switched from, say, male to female, they failed to do so when the voice switched from one language to another, or from forward to backward speech. The dichotic listening experiment simultaneously reveals the limited capacity of attention and the basis on which attentional selection occurs. You can pay attention to only one conversation at a time. We process information from only one channel at a time. And just as we pay attention to our companions by looking at them, so we discriminate between the attended and unattended channels on the basis of their spatial location or other physical features. Physical analysis comes first. Analysis of meaning comes later. Or, at least, that's the way it seemed from these early experiments. Based on experiments of this sort, Donald Broadbent, another British psychologist, proposed a filter model of attention which looks a little bit like the multi-store model of memory that we examined earlier. In Broadbent's model, information arriving at the sensory receptors is first held in the sensory registers, or something very much like them, from which it passes through a selective filter 
into a limited capacity processor like short-term memory that compares sensory information with information already present in long-term memory. Depending on the results of this comparison, the newly arrived sensory information may itself be deposited in long-term memory and may be used to generate some response executed through bodily systems like the muscles and the glands. In broadband system, the limited capacity processor, like short-term memory, is tantamount to consciousness. Thus, attention is the pathway to awareness. Pre-attentive processing is unconscious processing. Post-attentive processing or attentive processing is conscious processing. Which raises the further question of how much pre-attentive processing there is. And according to Broadbent's theory, there's not very much. According to Broadbent, Pre-attentive processing is limited to a very narrow range of physical properties, such as the spatial location and the physical features of the stimulus. Anything else, like the analysis of the stimulus for meaning, has to be done attentively in the limited capacity processor, like short-term or working memory. That's why, in the dichotic listening experiment, subjects were able to focus on one ear and ignore information in the other ear. Attention is selecting one channel as opposed to another according to the physical features of the channel. The filter theory was a good start, but it turns out to have some problems. For example, Neville Moray, yet another English psychologist, found that in the dichotic listening experiment, subjects were distracted from the attended channel toward the unattended channel when their own name was presented over the unattended channel. And Anne Treisman, still another English psychologist, found that subjects would follow the shadowed passage if the presentation was shifted from one ear to the other. The fact that subjects can pick up on their own names presented over the unattended channel, or that they follow a message when it's shifted from one ear to the other, suggests that some attentional selection goes beyond the physical features of the stimulus. Subjects can pay attention to things based on their meaning. But if subjects can pay attention to something based on its meaning, to shift attention from one channel to another based on meaning, then there has to be some pre-attentive processing of the meaning of an event too, not just its spatial or physical features. Findings such as these led some theorists to propose late selection theories of attention, as opposed to theories like Broadbent's, which are early selection theories. According to early selection theories, like Broadbent's original proposal, attentional selection occurs relatively early in the sequence of information processing, before meaning analysis can occur. In early selection theories, Attentional selection is based on an analysis of the physical and spatial properties of the stimulus. After attention has selected some objects based on their physical properties, only then are those attended objects given any semantic analysis or analysis of meaning. Physical analysis occurs pre-attentively, pre-consciously. Semantic analysis occurs post-attentively or consciously. In late selection theories, both physical and semantic analyses occur early in the information processing sequence, before attention is directed to them, so stimuli are analyzed for both their physical and their semantic features. And then, on the basis of this analysis, some are attended to and play a role in ongoing thought and behavior. Again, according to early selection theories, Pre-attentive processing is limited to developing a physical description of the stimulus. All available stimuli are processed at this stage, but things like identification, semantic description, categorization, and response are limited to the single stimulus selected on the basis of the physical descriptions composed at the early stages. But according to late selection theories, all available stimuli are also identified 
and processed for meaning pre-attentively, outside of consciousness. Attention and consciousness are therefore required only for response. In late selection theories, you direct attention to some stimulus, not just based on its physical features, but also based on its meaning, on its relevance, or its pertinence for the task at hand. The controversy between early selection and late selection theories of attention continues right down to this day and can sometimes get very, very vigorous. It boils down to a question of the extent of pre-attentive processing. How much can you analyze a stimulus without paying conscious attention to it? Is pre-attentive processing limited to analyses of perceptual structure, as implied by the early selection theories? Or can it extend to semantic meaning as well, as implied by the late selection theories of attention? This issue bears on the problem of unconscious perception raised in an earlier lecture. It seems obvious that you can't pay attention to an object that you can't detect, which is what a subliminal stimulus is, just by definition. So the question of pre-attentive processing boils down to, how much can you process a subliminal stimulus? Can a subliminal stimulus be analyzed at all, perceptually? Or if it can, is the perceptual analysis limited to analyzing the physical features of the stimulus? Or can it extend to semantic features, like the meaning of the object? The seemingly endless debate between early and late selection theories of attention gave rise to a complete reformulation of the idea of attention in what are now known as capacity theories of attention. In this view, attention is not identified with any kind of filter, but rather with mental capacity, with a person's ability to deploy his or her cognitive resources in various directions. So we can equate attention not with some kind of filter, but rather with the amount of cognitive effort that the person is devoting to some particular task. These capacity theories assume that an individual's cognitive resources are limited. There is only so much cognitive capacity to be devoted to any particular task. But that we don't devote the same amount of cognitive capacity to every task that comes our way. Rather, the amount of attention required depends on the task to be performed, the demands of that task. Some tasks are very demanding, they require the allocation of considerable attentional resources in what is known as controlled processing. But other tasks are undemanding. They require little or no attentive effort, and they can be performed automatically in what is known as automatic processing. The interesting feature of this capacity theory of attention is that we can reduce the amount of attention that a task requires by becoming very good at it. As a result of extensive practice, processes that were once performed in a controlled manner, drawing on attentional resources, can now be performed in an automatic manner, drawing on little or no resources. The distinction between controlled and automatic processes, and the idea that controlled processes can be automatized through extensive practice sheds new light on the question of the extent of pre-attentive processing. In the traditional view, elementary analyses, say of the spatial or physical properties of a stimulus, are performed pre-attentively before attention has been devoted to the stimulus. But complex processes, such as those involved in identifying an object, analyzing its meaning, categorizing the object, they can only be performed after attention has been directed to them. Meaning analysis can't be performed pre-attentively. The revisionist capacity view agrees that elementary processes are typically performed before attention is directed to the object. It asserts that these elementary processes are just performed automatically. But it insists that even complex processes can be performed pre-attentively as well. Identification, meaning analysis, 
categorization, all that semantic stuff can be performed pre-attentively provided that the process has been automatized through practice. The fact that a task that was once very difficult can now be performed automatically is vividly illustrated by the Stroop interference experiment. In this experiment, subjects are asked to name the color of the ink in which words are printed, ignoring the words themselves. And subjects find this very difficult to do. They're trying simply to name the color, which ought to be a very simple task based on just the physical analysis of the stimulus. But they can't help reading the word, and this gets in the way of the color naming task. That's known as Stroop interference, and it occurs because for skilled readers of English, which we all are, those of us who are taking this course or teaching it, reading just occurs automatically, whether we intend to or not whether we're paying attention to the words or not. It just happens. But it didn't happen when you were five or six years old and just learning to read. That was hard work. But now that you're a skilled reader, reading doesn't take that kind of effort anymore. It's as easy as walking. Before you turn to the next slide, just demonstrate the Stroop interference effect for yourself. Beginning with the leftmost column, Simply name the color of the ink in which each word is printed. Ignore the words themselves. Just name the color of the ink and see how it goes. Whether a process is innately automatic, like a reflex, or whether that process has been automatized through extensive practice, automatic processes seem to have a set of features that they share in common. First is, Inevitable evocation. Automatic processes are inevitably evoked by the appearance of specific environmental stimuli, regardless of the person's conscious intentions. In the Stroop interference experiment, you can't help but read the word, even though you are not intending to do so. Second, incorrigible completion. Once engaged, Automatic processes proceed inevitably to their conclusion. It's a little bit like a ballistic missile. Once it's launched, there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to fly until it hits the ground. By efficient execution, we mean the execution of an automatic process concerns no attentional resources, or very, very little by way of in attentional resources. This permits parallel processing. Because they consume no attentional resources, automatic processes do not interfere with other ongoing cognitive processes. You can multitask. You can do some things in parallel so long as they're all automatized. Automatic processes are unconscious processes in the strict sense of the term because they operate outside of our phenomenal awareness. We have no idea that we're doing what we're doing automatically. And they operate outside voluntary control. We don't control their initiation, and we don't control their completion. Controlled processing, by contrast, is conscious processing. We initiate and terminate it at will. Conscious processing, controlled processing, consumes cognitive resources. And when it comes to controlled processing, we're pretty much confined to doing one thing at a time. As we'll see in the next lecture, the amount of attention devoted to an event and the kind of attention devoted to an event is critical for its fate in long-term memory.